Och en av världens mest berömda författare, ofta nämnd i samband med Nobelpriset i litteratur. Jag talar om Joyce Carol Oates och henne har jag fått en exklusiv intervju med. Det handlade om romanen Jagad. Två äktenskap, ett djupt olyckligt och ett förmodat lyckligt. Och berättelsen tar avstamp i en återkommande mardröm om två människor som mött döden tillsammans. Två skelett sammankopplade med handbojer. Här är hon, Joyce Carol Oates. So hello, uh, Joyce Carol Oates. I'm so honored to have you in my show and be able to do this interview. Thank you. Very happy to be here. And as I understand, you are sitting in your home, as most people do these days, because of the pandemic. Yes, I live four miles outside Princeton in a rural area. Mm. How is it now, the situation for you? I mean, it's so, uh, it's so much isol isolation for most people. Yes, I, I see friends with whom I go for walks. So I see about eight, eight people and I, we, we go walking usually or we may gather outside. I remember when I saw you, it's 15 years since I saw you and interviewed you, that you were having as a routine that you were jogging every day and you had small pieces of papers in your pockets so you, and a pencil. Well, I, I try to jog or walk every day, yeah. but I don't always take paper and pencil. Because I just remember. If I remember. So uh, let's talk about the, um, uh, the novel that you wrote. I've been reading it uh, yesterday and I couldn't stop reading it. And then I couldn't sleep during the night because it's a really creepy, scary story. Yes, it's about basically the intrusions of memory into our life in the present tense. And it's it's um, um, it's about a, a young girl. She was the day after her wedding, and she wakes up and she walks out in front of a bus, and nobody knows if it's uh, an accident or if she does it uh, by by meaning and. Um, then her husband is sitting next to her at, at the hospital because she's severely injured. Uh, and then the memories comes back and unwheels sort of. And it's about two skeletons. How did you come up with that idea? I was haunted by that image of two skeletons, two people who had obviously died at the same time and were together and linked together. I, I won't give away the plot of, of the novel, but there is an explanation for it. And when the girl is in the hospital, her husband is, is really interrogating her. He's asking her questions because he's consumed with curiosity. They married very young, she's only 20, and he doesn't know her that well. And so he's, lear he's learning about her along with the reader. But it's also a secret, uh, a secret that he's, she's been carrying on for all, all her life. Uh, and it's about loyalty. It is a secret. I wanted also the contrast to marriages. A marriage in the past, which was a disastrous marriage, and a marriage in the present, in the present between the young people, which has to struggle, but eventually is a strong marriage. I wonder, uh, because you are very often writing about um, stream of consciousness. I mean, it, have you a certain technique or something like that? Because it's like you get into this person's mind and you, you see these images of the conscience, consciousness. Usually when I write, I immerse myself in the personality of a character. And to me, they don't seem like characters in a novel. They seem like real people. 
So I go very deeply into their minds and their memories. And much of what they are experiencing is semi-conscious. So they're dramatizing some of the buried memories. And the, the story, as it unfolds, will bring this to consciousness. Do you think, uh, uh, because what I've been thinking about, reading about this, that uh, this the little girl that thinks that she has to carry this secret all her life by herself, do you think that uh, causes her trauma, that she can't speak out and tell somebody about it? Yes. There was violence between her mother and her father. Her father was a veteran of the Iraqi war and he was traumatized. He was wounded in the war, not only physically, but also mentally. And he comes back like many veterans of foreign wars in America without any sense of uh, identity. And there's always there's such a feeling of ambivalence in this country toward the military. So when he comes back, he's not a hero and he's lost his soul. And as a consequence, he takes out his frustration on his wife. And this is also about, uh, I don't know if, it, as I read it, it's also about the US, the American society, how the society or the state treat people that try to be loyal and they go out in the war and comes back and uh, their lives are totally ruined or destroyed. Yes, that's very much, it's very familiar in the United States. There's a good deal of um, acclaim when a young man joins the military and goes off to fight in a war. But then if he comes back and he's wounded and could be psychologically wounded, there are many, many people, uh, the suicide rate is very high among, among veterans. So in my novel also, the, the, the veteran does commit suicide also in my novel. But in the meantime, he does much damage to his family. And they, those men goes around in the society and quite, are quite dangerous, uh, not only for themselves, but for their families and uh, people that are close to them. Yes, we also have very lax gun laws in this country, so virtually anyone can have a gun, which is totally un, unheard of in, in Sweden. It seems so barbaric. We are basically entrapped in a quasi-primitive society in the United States in which people can bear what they call bearing arms, guns. How do you get into this uh, dark uh, world? Because, I mean, I know in your master classes you said that as a writer you need to explore Uh, your fear and your taboos to be able to to write about it. Oh yes, I think that's that's very true. I'm also exploring the violence that women are vulnerable to. In our society, a, if a woman is threatened by a man, very often the law enforcement will not help her. So in my novel, the the wife of the veteran appeals for an injunction to the court and she doesn't get much protection from the police at all. She's like a prisoner. I mean, it's really scary how she doesn't even know how to call for help. That's true. She doesn't really know what to do, but she did not anticipate that it would be so extreme. Mm -hmm. she, did not she did not expect what happened. How did how how did this start? I mean, how did you got this idea to to write about this uh, really dark and violent story? Uh, I don't want to give away too much of the novel, but I was haunted by the same image that the girl is. Just as the girl has this image of the skeletons out in in the field by a creek, I was haunted by that image for many years. And I wanted to write a novel that would encapsulate it. It's like a very powerful nightmare image. But by confronting our nightmare images and bringing them to daylight, we exorcise them. Mm -hmm. How come you were haunted by that? 
I don't think we can explain why we're haunted by anything. To, to be a writer is to be haunted by memories and images. So like a painter or a musician or a poet, you are haunted by something that you have to present to the world in some kind of coherent way. Because the image in itself is not explanatory. Mm. So you work, you think about it and work it into a story. Storytelling will explain. And as I said before, I wanted to write about two marriages. One is the marriage in the past that was damaged, but the new marriage I have much hope for. Both the young people, they love each other, and the young husband is not like the, not like the veteran. The young husband really loves his wife. Mm. And he wants to help. And he represents a newer generation. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the situation right now, because you wrote, uh, you wrote an article in The New Yorker, a short story, and it was before the uh, corona pandemic. And, and it's really scary because this is what you wrote about. You predicted it. Well, I, pre I predicted people wearing masks. The, the first image in my story is a woman wearing a mask to work out in her garden because the earth has gotten toxic. So there might be some bacteria that are loosed by the soil when she's, she's digging in her garden. So that, that was, yes, that was last October. I mean, that was a, that was a more than a year, that was a year ago. I mean, it was in October, 2019, which was before the pandemic. When my story came out, there was nobody was wearing a mask. But a few months later, everybody was wearing a mask. So, so uh, how did you get that inspiration? Well, the, the focus on toxins in our soil, earth and water, is not new with me. I mean, we have a difficult time with our, our governing bodies in some of the states of the United States are very lax. So there are contaminated areas of the United States, and some drinking water is contaminated. So my story was about people who are victims of climate change, also a very lot of deluge of a rain, rainstorm and some mudslides where they're living because of climate change. And then they feel they have to wear the mask because of the, the air being polluted. At the same time, it's, it's not an unhappy story because they're playing music and we feel that they may come through. They have a play a Schubert quartet and there's a gathering of, of friends. Before the pandemic, the, there is not any contagion. The, at that time, the fear was of the earth and the soil and the water, not one another. So the, the human community in my story is still very strong. Well, I was, was wondering, what do you think about uh, how the uh, American society will change after the pandemic? Because this is, uh, I mean, everybody is, uh, I mean, involved in this and affected by this in one way or another. Well, we have two problems in the United States. One is biological, that's, that's the illness, the, which is a contagion, but it's, it's a natural phenomenon, it's biological. Our other problem is political. So I don't really wanna talk about the political situation, but that is very divisive and we have a social problem as a consequence. We have a very serious political division in the United States and it has become a social problem. And the, the biological phenomena of the pandemic is separate. It's, got, it's much worse because of the political situation. But we, it's not a simple situation here. We don't just have the pandemic. That would be handled very, very 
that could be handled very expertly if, if scientists were in control, but we have politicians in control in this country. And so that has been a real, it's been a tragedy. It did not have to happen this way. I know that you have, you are, have been teaching for many years uh, in creative writing. And uh, I know that you have mentioned that uh, one of uh, the most important inspiration was Alice in Wonderland. Why is that book so important to you? Well, it was the first book that I read that was of, of significance. My grandmother gave it to me when I was eight or nine years old. So it was probably the first real book. It was a children's book with illustrations and it was quite large. And I loved it. I really memorized most of it. Deep in my memory, imprinted in my brain, are large, long passages from Alice in Wonderland. And of course, because Alice was a little girl, she's seven years old in, in the book, I identified with her and that was really wonderful. So this is how important it is for a child to get a book from a grown up that has taught that kind of inspiration. Oh, absolutely. We were on a, a farm and we did not have many books. This book came from my grandmother and my grandmother lived in the city. So she could go to a bookstore but out in the country, um, there was nothing there. I went to a one-room schoolhouse in the country, and there were really no books. It was not a society in which there were books at all. But I, if I could go to the Lockport Public Library, which was seven miles away, when I got a little older, I could take books out of a library. So that began my life as a reader. Mm. And a writer, probably, true. Yes, we read before we write. Mm. Thank you so much. Are you writing uh, on a new novel? Because you seem to be writing all the time. I'm writing a suspense novel. Okay. Suspense. Yes. Thank you so much for letting me interview you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.